Welcome to our service today. I hope you'll find it to be an encouragement in your life. Um, a life that right now is dominated by the super importance of badly needing a haircut um, and being locked down in your home and doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing to comply with the situation that we're in. I don't mean to make light of the matter. It's a serious matter, but at some point you have to figure out if you can just laugh about it or not. Today, Alan will be speaking to us about Moses and the people of Israel and Moses leading them out of a land dominated by a single culture that was oppressive. And it's interesting to me in this time that um, he's taking them to a place where there are at least six different cultures mentioned. One of the things that I've been thinking a lot about uh, during the pandemic and reading a fair bit about during the pandemic is oppression and race and culture. And, um, it's hard not to in these days if you're paying attention at all on what's going on in life. And I hope this morning as I listen to Alan, I, I can become clearer and clearer in my own thinking about what it is to be part of an oppressive culture. We don't like to admit it, I don't think, too much. We don't like to talk about it really at all, but I know I've been thinking about it a lot. That within all of us is this capability to be oppressive. I'm not sure exactly what the definition of oppressive is. For me, I think it uh, is leaning more a little bit towards if I'm not doing something to help the situation, then I'm at least tolerating the oppression and I need to figure out how to stop that. So I trust this morning will be an encouragement to you or the afternoon or evening or whenever you tune into this as we continue on. In Jesus' name.
Let us pray for our community. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we are all in different places. Some are coping well with the lockdown, the pandemic. Some are struggling. Some are lonely. Um, Lord, we just lift each one of us up to you and pray that we will know that we can just sit with you and listen to you and talk to you and just lay these concerns at your feet. Lord, we're thankful for um, this church and there's so many hurting in this church at this time physically, Lord. We pray for um, people who are in the hospital, Linda, um, Fred, Lord, people struggling at home, Beryl, Donette, Enroy, Flo, Liv. Lord, we pray for healing and we pray for peace, peace that passes all understanding. Lord, we are thankful for what's happening next door and we continue to pray that you will be in that work, Lord, um, as we struggle to make plans with the pandemic. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to lead us. Lord, I thank you for a beautiful day today as we record this, we're thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's scripture is found in Exodus 3, 1 to 15. Moses was shepherding the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the west end of the wilderness and came to the mountain of God, Horeb. The angel of God appeared to him in flames of fire blazing out of the middle of a bush. He looked. The bush was blazing away, but it didn't burn up. Moses said, what is going on here? I can't believe this. Amazing. Why does, doesn't the bush burn up? God saw that he had stopped to look. God called to him from out of the bush, Moses, Moses. He said, yes, I'm right here. God said, don't come any closer. Remove your sandals from your feet. You're standing on holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face, afraid to look at God. God said, I've taken a good long look at the affliction of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries for deliverance from their slave masters. I know all about their pain. And now I have come down to help them pry loose from the grip of Egypt, get them out of the country and bring them to a good land with wide open spaces, a land lush with milk and honey, the land of Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. The Israelite cry for help has come to me and I've seen myself how cruelly they're being treated by the Egyptians. It's time for you to go back. I'm, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people the people of Israel out of Egypt. Moses answered God, but why me? What makes you think I could ever go to Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? I'll be with you, God said, and this will be the proof that I am the one who sent you. When you have brought my people out of Egypt, you will worship God right here at this very mountain. Then Moses said to God, suppose I go to the people of Israel and I tell them, the God of your father sent me to you 
and they asked me, what is his name? What do I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Tell the, pe tell the people of Israel, I am sent me to you. God continued with Moses. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. God, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob sent me to you. This has always been my name, and this is how I will always be known. Greetings, my friends. We welcome you again to our virtual service here at Weston Park Baptist Church. You know, we uh, were hoping that the pandemic would, uh, would ease up and we'd be back together again, but we've said this so many times, unfortunately, as you know, here in Toronto, things in Ontario have um, heated up again. So I know that everybody feels a little bit of stress and anxiety about over it all. Um, but perhaps the series on a God who comes towards us continually might be an encouragement for us uh, in these challenging days. So a God who comes towards us, we began a couple of weeks ago with the creation account, Genesis 3, that God comes to us in creation, the parable of created things. I thought particularly of the Genesis 3 text we're reminded that God walks with uh, Adam and Eve in the garden um, in whatever way that was, but clearly God with them, walking with them in presence, real time. So a God who comes towards us. In creation, last week we looked at the story of Abram, Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, where God reveals himself specifically as person as he did to Abram, Abraham, and he does to us. God is a personal God. He has the characteristics of person, and he speaks to our hearts person to person, which is absolutely amazing. You can think of the God of creation, the God of the universe, who still has the desire to uh, know us and walk with us uh, in a personal way. So uh, Coretto speaks to that in this a statement, the God of faith is not a God who is silent, a God who is inactive, a God who is not present to us. To you who are a person, he is a person. To you who have life, he is life. To you who have love, he is love. He is the other who is searching for you. God coming to us person to person. And of course, we see this in the most magnificent way in Jesus, God revealing himself to us in Jesus and then through the Holy Spirit in our own lives. So God is person. That's the story in Genesis 3. And now when we, or it's Genesis 12, sorry, when we go to Exodus 3, we, where we're looking today, we're reminded of the story of Moses and the call of Moses. And here we find that God is a God who is active, a God who is active in history, a God who works in our world. He is not a deist God who creates the universe and then pulls away and is far, far away and just observes. No, the God of the scriptures is a God who is active in our world. And so in this story, we see God concerned about the state of the Israelites under the oppressive regime of, of Pharaoh and how he desires to work for their uh, good and for their favor. And he does that then and he does that now. So that's, that's where we're going now. God is a God who acts in history, acts in our world. He partners with us. So that's, that's the third piece that we think of in this idea of God as a God who comes towards us. So we begin then with verse 1. We hear the statement, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. And he looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. Exodus 3, 1 to 3. So we, we begin just with the observation that, that Moses lives with awareness. He, he is observant of what is going on around him. 
he is curious. He sees this bush. It seems to be on fire, but the bush is not actually burning up. So there's a flame, but it's not being consumed, as the text says. It doesn't just burn away. He finds this very curious. And he says to himself, well, I'm going to go check this out. I want to see why, why this is happening. If it's happening at all, he, he wants to go, and he goes. And we may think, well, that, you know, so what? I mean, he's aware of that. We, we would all do the same thing. Well, maybe we would and maybe we wouldn't. If you're a shepherd out there in the fields and you're taking care of all of your sheep, your goats, whatever that might be, Bolivia would be llamas, apaca, donkeys, if you're taking care of your animals and are concerned about them, you may not want to take the time out to go a couple hundred yards away to check out this bush that seems to be burning. Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. And in our culture, often we, we simply live bored lives. We get stuck in our routine. And we don't get excited much about much of anything. And so we don't turn aside. But Moses, he, he, he isn't stuck. He's curious. In the early church, they, they talked about the sin of acedia. And acedia was restless boredom, where it's just an ennui in your life, and you're just, you're just kind of going through the motions, day in, day out, the passion of acedia. And that can happen in any day. Well, Moses is not there. He's a shepherd, but he's very aware of what's going on in his life. He sees this reality. He goes out to check it out. So he lives with awareness. And of course, that's, that's the invitation for all of us. Even in this pandemic, to live with awareness, to be aware of what is going on, aware of those around us, aware of the, you know, the, what's happening in our life, in our day, paying attention to it to pay attention, to live with awareness, to keep watch. The New Testament uses that word. So that's where we begin. With that, we see then, interesting, that, that God recognizes. Note this in verse 4. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. God does not act in this story until he sees that Moses is indeed interested. If Moses doesn't turn aside, he never does hear the voice of God. And, and God presumably goes another way to, to rescue his people. So it's when Moses shows some intention. And, and it's the same with us. God deals with us in person, but he wants to know if we're serious. He wants to know if we're engaged. Will we engage or not? He's not going to force himself upon us. So he always gives us freedom gives you freedom. And we may say, where is God? Where is God? Why he's not acting in my life? I want him to act. But in, in another way, we're not giving him the opportunity to act. So will we turn aside, you see? Will we turn aside from our own plans and decide to open ourselves up to the new possibilities that God has for us? I find that interesting that that's the case. When Moses turns aside, then God speaks, and he calls, we know this, Moses, Moses, double vocative, speaks his name. Before, last week, it was Abraham, Abraham, Abram, Abram. Here it's Moses, Moses. And God knows Moses' name, calls him by name. All the millions of people on the planet at that time in Moses' day, and God knows his name, speaks to him. It isn't just a shout out, hey, you. He speaks his name. And the wonderful thing is there that God also knows your name and my name. He really does. He created you. He's very much interested in your life and my life. And he calls us by name. We are somebody to God. And he is someone to know him and experience him. That's, that's lovely. Paul writes about it this way in Galatians 4.9, Now, however, that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God. That first part of that verse. We know him, and he knows us. And it's actually a beautiful thing that God knows us. We are known by God. We are known by the Creator. He knows 
The psalmist says all the numbers of hairs on our head, he knows. He knows when a bird falls. He knows the number of you know, sand particles on a beach. He knows all of that to be known by God, to be known by him. That's the invitation here. And so God speaks his name, Moses, Moses. Moses responds. The dialogue goes on. So we hear this dialogue, here I am. Moses engages, another, hey, another great response by Moses. He turns aside, and now when he hears his voice, he isn't afraid, he doesn't run away necessarily, but he speaks, here I am. Think of Samuel, the young Samuel, speak for your servant listens. So will we listen to God's voice? Will we respond? Will we say, here I am, or do we not want to turn aside? We want to just keep doing our own thing. So Moses engages this new possibility that lies before him. The dialogue continues. Then he said, that is God, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place in which you are standing is holy ground. And He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God, to look face to face in God's face. doesn't want to do that out of respect. And so we hear here, God continues speaking, and first of all, take off your shoes. Well, what is that about? Well, in the Middle East, in those days, if you went into somebody's tent, you would take off your sandals. So God is recognizing, hey, you are coming into my circle here. And it's actually a sign of hospitality. I welcome you. I welcome you in my tent, if you like. And I want to speak with you. So take off your shoes, draw closer to me. It's actually a sign of hospitality. So God speaks. And then he notes, he says, I am the God of your father. He's saying to Abraham, I, or to Moses, I, I'm connected to your family. Last week we looked at Abraham. Moses is connected in that line. And he says, I'm, I'm the God of your father. I'm on your side. I have something for you. So he connects. I'm part of your family history. He dialogues with Moses. And the reality is here, 1,500 years to Christ, 1,500 years or 2,000 after, so 3,500 years, God continues to speak to us. And we call it prayer. We are in conversation with God. We are in dialogue with God from a spiritual disciplines perspective, this is prayer. This is conversation. There's a dialogue going on. It's like you sitting at your kitchen table in the morning and you have a coffee and you have conversation with God. You imagine that Christ is sitting at that chair across from your table and you have a conversation. Someone has called that kitchen table prayer, conversational prayer. You, you know that God is with you. You imagine God with you in that way and you have a conversation. And you speak about your life. You speak about the day that's coming up. You bring him into your life. And we may say, well, God, clearly, God can't be interested in everybody's lives like that. But that's the way God is revealed. He is God, man. He is creator. We are the creature. He is possible. All things are possible, we hear of God. And so, yes, he can have a conversation with you, conversational prayer in your home. He can have conversational prayer with me in my home. Through the day, God is God. Look at the universe, all the possibilities. He can do the same with us. So a dialogue with God means that we are in conversation with him. Today we would call that we are in prayer. We speak and God listens. And we listen for his voice in our minds and our hearts. This dialogue carries on. The Lord said, I have observed the mystery of my people who are in Egypt, the misery. I've heard their cry and account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, he says. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God says to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So that's, you know, that's an amazing statement. 
the dialogue goes on, and God comes to his key point here is he says, I, I see my people who are suffering. I see my people who are hurting. And I want to act on their part, on their behalf. And so the point of this God is coming toward us today is that God comes to us and he acts. He engages. He isn't passive. He's not the deist God. He comes and he acts. In your life and my life, he identifies with us he identifies with our hurts, and when we are suffering, God comes to us. We see that ultimately in Jesus Christ as he suffers on the cross for you and for me, teaches us about suffering. And in doing so, God reveals his name. I am who I am, which is a play on the verb to be. It can be translated a variety of ways. I will be who I am with you. I will be who I will be. I am who I am. And so it's a statement of promise. It's a promise to Moses, I am with you. I will be with you. And the people ask, what is his name, this God? They want to know that he's more than just a local God. Other gods were local gods too. They want to know that God is powerful enough to actually overcome this Egyptian uh, tyranny and this dynasty, the most powerful nation on the planet at the time, I want to know that God is able to do that, so what's his, what is his name? That's what they're asking. If he's just a local God, then he won't, he won't be able to overcome the Egyptian gods. So how will he do? And he responds, God responds, I am who I am. And this is interesting to see, and to pause just for a moment, because note, he does not say, I, I am your father, male. He doesn't say, I am your mother, female. He reveals himself as, I am who I am, pure spirit, neither male, neither female. God's presence towards us, beyond all of the human differences of, of gender. God is a God who is for us, who incorporates characteristics of both, the, of our experience, male and female, the whole human experience, God relates to all of that. So if you are listening to this, and maybe you've come from homes where your father wasn't the greatest uh, role model for you. Maybe your father did things that might have hurt you in some ways. And you have a hard time relating to God as father, because it brings back a lot of memories. Well, here we have a, a very specific statement from the text that says that God is neither male nor female. But God supersedes all. He is, I am who I am. He is pure spirit. Jesus recognizes that in other places as well. Chichester writes of this name, I am who am. I am being. I am the essence of all life. I am the spirit that breathes in everyone, the source that magnetizes every soul. I am the one in whose image all human beings, male and female, Genesis says clearly, remember that? We looked at that, Genesis 1, 26, 27, are made, I am. In other words, ungendered, unsexed, pure spirit, pure energy, pure life. I am who I am. Pure spirit of love for you and for me, beyond whatever role models we have, male or female, God is beyond all of that. I am who I am. God for you, God for me. So it opens up you know, all kinds of possibilities in terms of, of who God is. You know, there are different names for God in the scriptures. One is sapientia, which is wisdom. I am wisdom. Another one is Adonai. I am your secret, your sacred Lord, sorry. Orient, I am the the dawn, the morning dawn. I am Emmanuel, I am with you. In, in all of these things. El Shaddai, I am the powerful God. All these names remind us of who God is for us. And he's not limited to any small model that we might have. So not simply father, not simply mother. God is God. I am who I am, and that God continues to stay engaged in our lives, a powerful God for you and for me, who is active in our world and who remains active. 
In spite of all the stuff and crap that the humanity is doing to our planet, God is still God and his purposes ultimately will prevail. That's the beauty. So it is this God who is in journey with us, who is with us in our Exodus experience, on our adventure. God is spirit who is with us, who is active, and we are called to be receptive to who this God is. But we note it is not an easy way. It's a demanding way. You know, we see this as you read the Moses story on. Moses hears all this, and he's not really too keen to get engaged. He starts making excuses. First one being, well, what's your name? Because they're going to ask me. And then he's going to say things like, well, I I can't speak. I, I I don't speak well. So I can't be the speaker for you to Pharaoh. And then God says, well, maybe I'll send along your brother Aaron so he can speak. So it, it's, it's back and forth. No, God changing his plans, if you like, depending on where Moses, his protagonist, wants to go. So God engages us. But it is not an easy way. It's a demanding way. We, we have to recognize that. It's interesting in the Gospels, Uh, Jesus says this, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? And what's interesting here is that this saying or this command, deny yourself, it's interesting that of all the sayings of Jesus in the Gospels, this is the only one that is actually repeated in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So often the synoptics might gather together, but then John won't. All four. So clearly this statement on denying yourself and taking up your cross and following me is key. And when you take up your cross and follow Jesus, that is not an easy thing to do. That is demanding. So demanding that you might decide you don't want to do it. Or you pick it up and you start following and after a while you say, you know what, I can't do this, I don't want to do it. You put it down and you go your own way. You probably have known people who have started following Jesus and then go through some rough times and they say, that's it, I'm out. I thought it would be easier than this. I thought God was on my side and everything would go well. So I'm out, I'm out. Jesus says right from the beginning, man, it's it's going to be costly. It's going to be demanding. Take up your cross and follow me. But if we do it, then we gain. It all, there's always a promise with the command. The promise is that you will have life, eternal life, eternal life in your heart, in your own fullness, in your own authenticity. Now this is God's intention for you and for me as creature to be engaged with the creator. This is the beauty of it. But it is a challenging way. Moses knows it, and we know it. If you look in our heart, we know it as well. So having said all that, you know, where do we go with this? We're saying that God is an active God. So one, will we hear and be attentive to his voice in our lives? When he says your name in your heart, in your mind, in your own conscience, you've heard his voice. You may not have heard it, probably have not heard it vocally, audibly, but I know you have heard his voice somewhere along the line. Your name whispered in your heart, your own mind, your own consciousness. Your name. What do we do with that? What do we do with that call? So will we hear? Will we respond? Will we engage? Will we be active? God is an active God, but will we be active? And oftentimes we prefer our own comfort, our own convenience, our own ways. We say not your kingdom, but my kingdom, Jesus. So will we say yes, and will we engage the God who comes toward us, who acts in our lives, acts in your life, and it actually indeed wants a journey and a walk of intimacy, of closeness. Later on, we're told that Moses is God's friend. We heard in other places Abraham was God's friend. Remember that story in Genesis 18? 
Moses sees these, or Abraham sees these two individuals coming, and it's actually God speaking to one of his, to an angel. And he says, will I not tell Abraham, he's my friend, what I'm going to do here in Sodom and Gomorrah? He says, yes, I will. I won't keep it from him. That's an image of conversation, of closeness, of intimacy. And the reality for you and for me is in this pandemic day, when things here seem to be actually getting worse here in Ontario, God is a God who wants to walk with you closely. The biggest thing in your life as creature is to know the Creator, and the good news is that He is for you. He comes towards you, and He wants to work in your life and my life, in the life of our church community, Weston Park Baptist Church. God is not passive. He's there. He wants to engage. He calls your name. Will you open your heart? Revelation says He's knocking at the door. You've got to open the door from the other side. You've got to do it. I've got to do it. Open the door, and God comes in. New opportunities, new adventures. Farther up, farther in, higher up, higher in. C.S. Lewis says in the Narnia series, for you and for me, may we say yes to a God who comes and wants to be active in your life, my life, no matter where you're at, no matter what situation, no matter where you live, God wants to come into your room and he does so through Jesus, through his spirit. May we say yes to him, know him, love him, join him in this journey of life. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. i